The Joyful Friar podcast is made possible by the generous support of our friends. To support the podcast, please visit nathan-castle.com and donate today. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle, your host. And today I have a friend and colleague or colleague and friend, Donna Rebido, with us. Uh, I've known you, what, maybe a couple of years now? Maybe two I think or so. maybe three. Yeah. Um, we live not that far from one another in Arizona, you in Phoenix and me down in Tucson. And um, we both have an interest in near-death experience and all kind of uh, uh, afterlife-related things and so on. So I know that we'll have a lot to talk about today. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on your podcast. And I want people to know you've done uh, 74 podcasts, and that's that's pretty amazing. And you have 2,000 subscribers to your YouTube channel. And in 20 years, you've helped 250 stuck souls. And I find all that amazing. And I hope people realize what a gift you are to us. What a sweetheart. Social. You come on my show to promote me. Is that the thing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a podcaster. That's all I know. Father. I know. And you, uh, Donna is the podcaster that taught me how to podcast. You had uh, you were out there. How old is your podcast anyway? How long has it been going? Four, four and a half years. It'll be five this November. And get a plug in for it. What's the name of it? So my podcast is Exploring Consciousness with Donna on all the social media, all the podcast websites. And I have a companion website, exploreconsciousness.com. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, 85,172 downloads. I'm in 121 countries. So it's it's getting some pretty good stuff. And we help people who are just uh, not really sure where to go when they realize we're more than our physical self. So. Yeah. And a lot of people go online for trying to figure out who I am and what I'm about and my purpose and destiny and all of those things. Well, good for you. So I've had I've had Father Nathan on my podcasts uh, around uh, podcast something like ninety podcast number ninety two to ninety three, and that was a very very nice podcast that we had together, Father Nathan. You you took a class in podcasting or something, didn't you? I, I did. I took. I, I did. And you've been an educator for a long time, so that's the way educators operate. <laughs> they they sign up for class. <laughs> Well, I've been in classes my whole life, so yeah. I have five five college degrees, and I don't know how many workshops. So we we just don't we can't stop learning. So thank you for that. Well, anyway, uh, I'm grateful that you got me started. But so, um, what do you feel like is the main um, message that you're doing all this for? What is it that you want to offer the world? Well, a lot of people want to know about near death experiences. They're either afraid of death. And I'd done, I'd done some chaplain work at Phoenix Baptist Hospital. And I found that people really want to know what is on the other side. And so I tell them about my near-death experience. And I tell them, look, this is my experience of the other side. And there are like seven or eight billion people on the planet. And they all have, they're all having their own experience. So can you imagine being on the other side if we all went together? <laughs> so it's like there's going to be seven billion near-death experience experiences that are different so i just tell them this is what i experienced in seeing the creator of the universe so my message is that there it your your consciousness still goes on um when i died when i drowned that the the pain uh was that i had a tow rope wrapped around my leg and strangled it to the bone so there was pain in that but the process of dying was not painful at all you were being dragged immediate... along by a boat right yes well, to give yes. us the out the basics of that story Okay. Yeah. I was up in uh, Northern New York with my family and we were out fishing and we converted the boat from fishing to lake toys, skiing. And my sister and I got on a inflatable raft and it was a, it was a unique and horrific accident where um, the, the boat started taking on water. So my brother-in-law took his attention off of us and on to getting the boat to the shore. So my sister and I were thrown off and the tow rope got wrapped around my leg and I was being dragged underwater without his knowledge. Uh -huh. And so I knew I was drowning. I knew that's how I was going to die. In fact, I did drown and die and went over to the other side. So when immediately uh, I knew that I went through this veil kind of a thing, like a saran wrap veil. And um, 
immediately knew I had died. And since I was a, I'm, I'm a pilot. So in the pilot world, when we, we always tell each other, you know, if you have to crash, it's going to be a lot of paperwork for everybody. So my <laughs> thought was, oh, there's going to be a lot of paperwork for people. I died here. So and then I met the creator of the universe and we had a conversation and um, it was extremely transformative and powerful. And, you know, when you hear near death experiences, the amount of love that you feel, you don't want to come back. But I was given a choice and I gave the choice back to God, which was not what I was expecting me to say. You surprised and, yourself, uh, right? I did. <laughs> it's like, I, like, okay, since you made me, I give the choice to you. And so the message I was given to come back with is to tell people about what choice means to human beings. So on my YouTube channel, I've done a PowerPoint because that's what teachers do. We do PowerPoints. And I did a, I'm doing a whole thing on choice. Like what, what are the different kinds of choices? How do we make choice? Uh, and what's important about choice that you make? And in your books are all about choice. You talk about stuck souls that made some choices on the other side that have gotten them stuck. So both of us have the message of be constantly, uh, uh, you know, be aware of how you're living your life, how you're thinking, how you're choosing. And that'll make a, a whole lot smoother transition on the other side. So, Don't you find that some of what people think of as a choice was really more of a default, where they didn't really come to a clear uh, moment where they thought I could do this or that and I choose this. Many times people are have just defaulted into stuff and they're living with the consequence of something that was a decision, but that didn't have a lot of choice involved in it. Yeah, and I talk about that. What if what if you're in a situation where there was no choice, where you really were caught in a situation? Uh, but most people, they, you know, I mean, you're talking about like kidnapping or things like that, or if you're stuck in a choice where you don't have skills to get out of. So that's what I'm addressing. The whole uh, spectrum of choice of don't don't go to a default, but but pay very close attention to your belief systems, how you think about others. So if they go to that, uh, my YouTube channel and look at the PowerPoint on choice, it's I'm making three major uh, PowerPoints, one for the beginner, one for the intermediate, and one for the advanced. So to kind of help people understand how much more power they have than they think they have. Mm. What do you do about uh, habitual behaviors where people feel like I can't do anything but this because they're so used to doing this because it's a habit? Right. In the intermediate, I talk to, I, I actually give a lot of resources and step by step how you begin looking at the choices that you're making. Like you said, most people are unaware they're making choices moment by moment. And so it's, it's, it's coaching them, teaching them how to one, be aware of the choices that you're making, what belief systems are based on that. And I have resources there on how to change. Was that an important idea to you before your uh, near death experience? No. So did no, the I mean, I would like you, we were both involved with college students. So college students would go to both of us and talk about their lives and how they were stuck in their lives. And we would talk about choices, but I never knew the importance until my near death experience, if that makes sense. Well, this audience doesn't know your background as an educator. So why don't you clue us in a little bit about that being around college students? I was a professor at uh, Paradise Valley Community College in the in the Maricopa Community College system for 30 years. And I taught in the areas of health, wellness, alternative medicine, psychology, computers, and Chinese medicine. So I was able to teach a wide range of students that are usually, they tended to be freshmen and sophomores coming to college in the community college system. So 30, 30 years of teaching, kind of, you know, in office hours and students coming and saying, help, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what to major in. They really didn't know about life. They're just kind of new to making choices in their lives. Right. Well, it's good that you were there to help people that avail themselves of your guidance to help them find their way. That's a really important part of working with college students. Um, yeah, and you know that. So I do. And while we're at all the different things that you do, what about basketball? So I was a, I was an athlete. Um, that's really the why I went to college. <laughs> Wayland Baptist had a 
they're the number one ranked women's basketball team in the United States at the time. And I wanted to be in the Olympics. So I went down to Wayland Baptist. I'm Buffalo, New York Catholic. And I went to a Baptist school in Texas. It's quite a cultural shock. Yeah. But by by playing basketball, um, the Nate Smith Hall of Fame decided that the Wayland Baptist College program, we were pioneers in our field. So anyone playing for them from 1948 to 1984 were elected in the Hall of Fame. So um, this is my Hall of Fame ring. There you go. I wanted to get that on camera. There you go. I knew you did. Uh, you know, this uh, it gets pre-recorded, but while uh, while we're at this, uh, the the uh, men's and women's tournaments are going on, and and especially the women's tournament just keeps growing and growing. The the uh, the notoriety of it and the the reach, the number of fans, and all that is 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 extraordinary. Well, when I started, there was no Olympic basketball for women. They played in the Pan American Games, and so the coach of the Pan American team was the coach of Wayland Baptist. But in 1976, they were going to have um, basketball in the Olympics for the first time in Montreal. But I had signed my professional softball. I, I played professional basketball softball. Once you signed a contract back then, you you were no longer eligible for the Olympics. So I ended up playing fast pitch softball in the summer of '76, and I watched the women's uh, team play in the Olympics. And, and I was actually um, invited to play in a league called the American Women's American Basketball Association. And that was the precursor to the WNBA. So we, you know, we feel like th this group of people feel like we broke the glass ceiling for all the kids now that are playing yeah. uh, in the Olympics in WNBA. Well, I was seven years at Stanford, and of course, the women's program there is just oh my gosh up here, and so I've, I've got them to cheer for for a little while longer and see how how they advance. Yes, to to watch the growth of of both uh, not only of women's basketball, soccer, all the sports, team sports for women. Um, I we you know my my generation we we get to see all that grow up, and we think it's wonderful for all these ladies to finally get the recognition they deserve, even though people think. Women's basketball, they only started playing in like 2012 or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can okay. tell the different. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> yeah, well, we got to watch the, the whole thing. You have a new book out. Why don't you tell us about the book? Well, thank you for that. Sure, it's, you practice uh, holding it up to the camera so that it looks right. <laughs> Look at that. It's perfect. So most people think I wrote about an NDE, but my first book is about the story of my my dog. I, I my, Me and my best friend trained seeing eye dogs for the eye dog foundation here in Phoenix. And so this book is about the first guide dog that we trained Wednesdays with Sadie, the miracle dog, because she had her own NDE. So we kind of, I kind of had an STE with my dogs. What was, what was her NDE? Uh, so she had two. She was, um, uh, she had to be taken off the guide dog, as a guide dog, you have to have perfect both. And so she had what's called uh, spinal myelopathy. So she she couldn't, her and her brother couldn't walk really well. So we got to have her back. And when we did, she had a, uh, what's called mesentery root torsion. So in a big chested dog, her end of their intestine or their abdomen mesentery twists. Yes. And so we had to rush her to the hospital and the doctor came out and said, no, she's not going to make it tonight. She, she's just not going to make it. And so, you know, you know, we, we like to pray to our saints, don't we? So we do, we do. To <laughs> God and the saints. And I said, please, all you guys up there, all y'all, if you can get this dog, please let her live. Uh, she's really special. And I promised God that if she lived, I'd do something special with her. And so we became a, a pet therapy team. And the book is about her life is growing up as a guide dog in training and then her illnesses and then, uh, her work with children up at the local hospital. Yeah, she's a medical. Were, yeah, you were in a hospital, a children's hospital with her quite a lot, right? Every Wednesday for four and a half years. Yeah. And so I, I I wanted to call it Wednesdays with Sadie. And I asked Mitch Album if it was okay if I used I like a book title, Tuesdays with Maury. And he said yes, I could. So okay. I made it Wednesdays with Sadie. Yeah. And it's the stories we we picked eleven stories. Uh, I mean, obviously every Wednesday for four and a half, there's well, it's a great read. Yeah. I um, thank you. I, read I, it. You. I think I read it in a couple of days' time. As soon as I got it. 
Yeah, it's a quick read. You know, my sister read it overnight. So um, it's it's not a thick book. It's, you know, it's just a really thin book. And, well, but it's, it's, it's heartwarming, I think. Yeah. And for people like us that have these podcasts and, and all this, um, you know, otherworldly stuff to talk about and mysteries and so on, um, it's also important that we just attend to what's right in front of us and help people that are right here, not just uh, uh, hereafter. So you were putting in the work every Wednesday for four years. Yeah, we did. And the kids, it's what was amazing is that the kids started telling everybody, you know, so we it's still only once a week. So during the week, the other kids would say, it's Wednesday, it's Wednesday, it's coming, Sadie's coming. So we we couldn't believe the outpouring of the kids and their parents when we would come up to the fourth floor. Um, they just couldn't wait for Sadie. So Do you have a favorite she, story she, to tell that was in the book or or maybe one that didn't make it in? Oh, that's a... <laughs> for one that didn't make it in i i think my my um probably my favorite story is the longest relationship that sadie had with a young man that had the same kind of thing that she did only in human terms he his stomach was really bad and mm -hmm. so sadie and, and jose really clicked together and so it became you know he was there frequently over those over that time yeah. and uh yeah. he and sadie went into the teen room and uh his mother and i just <laughs> those two had a miraculous story and um the, the thing of it is is that you have to be prepared for the kids being sick so her his mother wanted us there when the doctor gave him the uh, bad news of that he was going into hospice hospice as a teenager and so he wanted she wanted sadie there and so as we were walking down the hall the doctor bent over and told him um how serious it, it was going to be. So when we, by the time we walked up, he was able to grab Sadie and cry into her shoulder. And the mom and I cried. So the four of us were in the hall crying. And uh, the mother said, uh, we're going to find a hospice place and we want you and Sadie to visit. And we said, you bet we'll be there. And uh, Thursday of that week, she called and said, okay, we're set up for Friday. You can come at Friday and here's the address. Um, Thursday morning, she told us that. And Thursday night, she called us back and said, Jose didn't make it. He passed. And so um, she asked us to do the eulogy. So I didn't know how Sadie was going to react. And so we we went to the funeral, and Sadie and I walked up. And she looked into the, the um, casket. And she turned around and sat down like she was guarding him. Oh, yeah? And, I, and then I had to give the eulogy. <laughs> so... It's my favorite story, even though it's sad in, yeah. in, the, in a way, but the connection between Sadie and Jose and how she was able to comfort him all during that time was is the important thing for me, her work with the kids, was comforting children. And do you think Sadie's gift for being with sick children was um, affected by her own ill health? Yeah, I do. Uh, she's a medical intuitive. We would walk in a room and, and there you could, families could be in the room. So sometimes we'd walk in a room and there, the, the child would be on the bed, but there might be four or five family members there. But she would know who to go to. We were, we were always shocked. And how we knew that was after the visit, someone would come running out and said, you know, my mother was really devastated and Sadie went right to my mom. We couldn't believe it, how much healing went on. Hmm. So I think she did. I think she was not only medically intuitive, but I think her experiences helped her. Yeah. The International Association for Near Death Studies, IONS, and the conference is coming, the national conference, international conference is coming up in Phoenix, where you live and where I'm a couple of hours away. That's coming up at the uh, end of August, beginning of September. So you're going to be speaking. Yes, I'll be on a panel. I, I don't know the, the day or time yet, but I, I'll be on a panel speaking about my near death experience. Yeah. And, and I, I, I put, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm I'm also uh, where they're still in the process of approving proposals and stuff, but I've been approved for a, a panel also that's uh, Christian clergy talking about near death experiences and related things. Uh, and then maybe I'll have another presentation. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's really important to hear from a near death experiencer. Who, what, what did they experience on the other side? And then uh, it would really be important to add your, I always talk about you when I'm talking about my near-death experience, because I tell them, if you really want to understand the whole package, 
you know, if you read Father Nathan's, it's like, how do you live your life well on this side and live your life well on that side? And it's really all about love, isn't it, Father Nathan? No question. Love and and truth. Truth. Uh, and, and, you know, we're both followers of Jesus. And at one point, he just, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, it, it might connect with your um, research and the work that you're doing around choosing, because some people that I deal with who have died and are in the afterlife are held back in a way because they're believing something that isn't completely true. They're believing some half truth or they take some part of their story and exaggerate it into their whole story in a way that holds them back. Um, yeah, the first part of the choice is if you do if you do the PowerPoint is going to look at your belief systems and your you know your I have a homework assignment so your homework is to take you know like five packs of sticky notes and as you go along just see where your belief is what is your belief system and you'll find out during the course of a day or days you know to become aware of oh you know when it, especially when i'm telling my near death story people are saying well i don't believe that i said okay write that down that's part of your belief system and you ask people you start off with people in your talk you you say raise your hand if you believe your consciousness exists on the other side so it is about belief systems so we start there we start with beliefs before we go to choices yeah, that's important. Um, and we don't always recognize what what are the components of our belief system and so we're challenged right. on it. You know? Correct. We so believe. I challenge them. Yeah. yeah. So if people wanted to uh, avail themselves of the, of the resources that you put together, how did they do that? Well, if you go to the, if you go to the YouTube channel and you look up Exploring Consciousness with Donna YouTube, and you click on videos, you'll see the, the first one for beginners, choices for beginners, and it's a PowerPoint. And you can, if you know, if you have the wherewithal, you can download the PowerPoint, you can walk through the PowerPoint, you can take screenshots of the PowerPoint, and it gives you those resources. And so we start with suicide. And I tell people, you know, you have to, you have to be alive to go through this choice thing. You know, if you, if you commit suicide, you'll probably be seeing Father Nathan. <laughs> you can go to to Maybe. this side <laughs> but um so uh, there's suicide in my family my nephew committed suicide after coming back from the war and so that became really important for me to get the word out on you know suicide is that your pain is greater than your resources so i try giving lots of resources and ideas and links and tips like you know really um if you can stay alive and realize your belief system and your choices i would have students come into my often and tell me that they no longer had choices. And I said, well, you know, you can get on a, you can go down to Sky Harbor, get on a plane and go to wherever you want to go. You could do that. Just open up your possibilities and thinking. You don't have to stay in the situation. And I always had resources available for my students. So if they needed food, I had resources for the Andre house. If they needed a place to stay, I had better, uh, you know, domestic shelters, battered women's shelters that I have that I could always you know, tell them, look, here, here's the address, here's the phone number. You can't share that, but you can go there today. So it's really important that people understand, you know, like where where are they in their pain and how to come out of that. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, that idea that that I that I don't have what I need can just be so bullying. People can have an yes. internal voice that just just nags them that I can't I don't have what I need. And uh, I I preach that often to push back against it. That wait a minute, uh, uh, maybe that's true, but but could you con could you reconsider? Could you look around because there might be a resource that is close at hand that you've uh, uh, overlooked? Yeah, and if they if they email me, I give them resources. You know, kind of I'm, I, I take your philosophy. I'll help you out of the ditch, but I won't go down the road. So here's how to get out of the ditch. But here's all these resources, and I would tell my students, I will meet you halfway. If you're just sitting back hoping that I write your paper, it's not going to happen. And I can give you the resources on how to write the paper, how to start the paper, or how to do these things in their life, how to how to open up their mind to possibilities. And then I always thought it was important to say how. This is how you do it. You have to go here. But you have to be the one to get off your behind and go, you know, make the phone call. Or, of course. You know. Yeah. Now, you're also going to be speaking at Spiritual Awakenings International. You want to tell our audience about that? 
Yeah, Sue and I are going to be speaking in June. It's an online spiritual awakenings is for those that have had um, STEs, spiritually transformative experiences, NDEs, OBEs. It's it's a it's a greater overarching kind of experience for people. And I'll be talking again about uh, the the intersection between my uh, near death, Sadie's near death, and I'll be talking about my resources online. You, know, you have the, a the hour that they give you an hour's time slot? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I have an hour there. For any of you who don't know about that organization, it's only about maybe five to seven years old, something like that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's and, really me. And it's um it's something that couldn't have existed until the internet, <laughs> until all we all learned how to do Zoom and stuff. So it's been kind of a it's grown with the pandemic where so many of us were forced to learn <laughs> how to be on online forums but it, it is international it uses the uh, english and spanish as its two languages uh the speakers are from all over the world so when you're involved with spiritual awakenings international there's a whole bunch of stuff about time zones to make sure you understand what time it is where the uh where if you want to take part live and then everything in it is also recorded so you can um uh, you know register get uh the content and see it at a time that might not be the middle of the night for you but um uh, that that's organization is out there spiritual awakenings international anyone in this audience can uh, go online and find it and um it's it's a uh, donor based but it's an, a nonprofit, so they're very good about offering a lot of things for free and asking for a donation if you want to help it along well, yes i was happy to learn that i, I was i, I was uh, because i'm a speaker on it i was on their website and i was scrolling around to see who else is there who might like to, and boom there's donna rebido how about that <laughs> got to make sure i get to that talk oh thank you yes yeah so i go into greater detail about my near-death experience what it was like to drown and more things about what happened to me on the other side but mm -hmm. um yeah i try to let people know and i've lived my life full of possibilities so um on my website, I, I've got to update my resume, but it's to show people that uh, I live, I live possibilities. I live choices. Yes, you know, you I, do. I don't, don't watch a lot of television. So. No, uh, I, I, every time I, I see you on Facebook or whatever you're doing a next thing, it's uh, uh, Adana has this whole thing about uh, jewelry making out of silverware, all uh, bending and twisting forks and spoons with, with uh, precious stones and feathers and so on. Tell us a little bit about how you got started doing that. Well, another thing is I'm an acupuncturist, so I do sports medicine and acupuncture. So when you're talking about something you can't see, like energy, you, know, you, you can see the effects of wind, but you know you can see the the bees yeah. bending over and you can see those effects. But it's hard to see effects of energy. So I take a, I, at the Monroe Institute, I learned how to do this. And I would take a spoon and I would just meditate for a minute. And then I would bend the spoon in all different kinds of shapes to show people this I'm doing with my energy. So when I do my acupuncture, that's going to be the same kind of energy that's going into you. That's It's good energy. And so I wanted to show that. So I started metal smithing. Someone asked me, challenged me donna why don't you make something out of the spoons that you're bending okay well i'll go do metal smithing. <laughs> so that in the metal smith the so world doesn't need a whole bunch of useless bent spoons why don't you turn them into no something? you do something out of them so um i have over 150 spoons and forks that i've bent, and so um yeah i make art out of them with my metal smithing skills and then i also make regular jewelry so i i make uh pendants and bracelets and all kinds of things just regular earrings regular jewelry that i do because i just am not doing enough and if people wanted to see it do you have like a an etsy store or some place where people can look at it and f maybe buy it well, I'm, on the exploreconscious.com it has across the top tabs of uh, my podcast my nde story my spoons, uh, my jewelry, so they can go there uh -huh. on the exploreconsciousness.com okay. website. And then lately, and, it's been uh, Indian flutes. I, well, part of my NDE, part of my NDE was I drowned, so my lungs aren't so hot. So about five years ago, I uh, I don't know if someone suggested to me or whatever, but start playing wind instruments. So I play the Native American flute. 
didgeridoo, and I just picked up the Anasazi rimblown flute. And those were to not only make good music, but um, to help my lungs. Yeah. I've been, I've been a guitarist and musician since high school. I've been a guitarist, so I knew music. Okay. Yeah, but you don't blow into a guitar, so it was a good idea to, to, no. to go into flutes. Um, Correct. What have you not done that you want to do? Well, it's interesting because like you, um, I'm, the veil to the other side has been very open. So I listen very closely to, uh, I do a lot of meditation. So I listen very closely to my guides and I always, my, my prayer has been, what would you like me to do next? How can I help? How can I be of service? Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of things. If you, if you look at my website from, you know, professional athlete to waitress in Switzerland to pilot to all these, all these different things. So it's not that I'm really looking and choosing. It's like, what, what is the spirit? What does the Holy spirit think it would be good for me to do in service? Mm -hmm. Can you describe what your spiritual practice in the course of a day is? Oh, it's constant. It's constant. And my near death experience allowed me to do that. So when you, when you hear pray unceasingly, I take that to heart. So when I'm doing stuff, if it, so I'm really close to my guardian angel. So if I'm doing stuff and involved in stuff, then will they continue the prayer so that it would be pray unceasingly? And then my meditation to me is a prayer. Yeah. And so I keep I keep lists. People from around the world email me and ask me to be on the healing list. So um, part of my acupuncture is doing a lot of healing. And I'm not the healer, as you know, you know. So it's, it's me, it's, it's not, I, I never live my life as if I compartmentalize my spirituality. I might compartmentalize my doing, like I have a room for my music, I have a room for my spoons, I have a room for my podcast, yeah. kind of compartmentalize, but I never compartmentalize my spirituality. Well, I've I've been a guest in your home uh, usually, always when you're not there. I'm <laughs> she, sorry. She just, she just uh, gives me the key. But um, give you, the key. <laughs> you can't you can't put anything down on a countertop without being next to a picture of Padre Pio. Can't. Uh, he's he's my he's my, he's, he's he's my best friend, man. He's like, yeah. Yeah. if any, well, of I got you... to I got to I got to visit in his room before they close it off. If you, they, they now have it closed, but I got an opportunity to go in there with Padre Joseph and Padre Alessio. So that was that was very cool. Yeah. So, yeah. You are just very cool. Uh, do you have something okay. that you want to leave us with that you haven't said yet or something that you'd like to emphasize? Well, I, I think it's um, acting. You know, even though we're human beings, not human doings, and, and it's like to, to be aware, to participate in your life, not to be passive, but to be um, very active and Choices. I mean, obviously, the, what we've been talking about very, very much. Be be aware of what you're saying and what you're thinking at all at all times. And um, that I guess when I'm 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 better when I am one on one than I am with the whole audience. And so, one on one pastoral, you know, helping people, you know, like you can do this. Let's figure it out. Let's untie the knot. Let's let's get you moving. I think is really important. So. If you could, and I have a lot of people that come that say, I don't know how to start. That's why I started the podcast. This is how you start. You know, come to the podcast, take a look, done 125 episodes. And so there's there's people there and, it, and the resources are amazing because it really is about resources. You know, I, I want to make sure that your resources are greater than your pain, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah, that's well put. Uh, and you've dealt with so many people who were so seriously ill that uh, good health isn't a prerequisite to this kind of thing. Oh, oh. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's um, not to wait because I, I, I've had a lot of people say, well, I'm going to wait. And, you know, like when I did guide dog training, people would come up to us and say, oh, what does it take? How do you do it? I think I'm going to wait. And then there's a fill in the blank, wait until I retire, wait till the kids go away, wait until, and I've never waited. Yeah. The reason I have a long resume and I've done a lot of things is I don't wait. Like, you know, I'm not sure what you're waiting for. So I can, I can relax and go to sleep on the other side. 
I think I'll have a lot of rest over <laughs> yeah, there. You can put your feet up in heaven. <laughs> I think I can put my feet up. I think I've done my due diligence for service here. So some of the people that I've helped in in afterlife ways are pretty much told that that they uh, they spent so much of their earth uh, time and, and consciousness doing so many things that and they start making lists of other things they want to do now. And sometimes they're told, "Well, that's a, that's." laudable but first we want to take you to disneyland they'll, they'll, they'll have they're told you need to play for a while you need to do something unproductive just because sometimes i i don't know if you do this but sometimes people will ask me in the, uh near the end of the day how was your day and i will default to productivity they didn't ask about a, what, what did you get accomplished today but they'll ask me how was your day and i thought oh, it was a great day i got this 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 and this done like that's the only way to enjoy a day is by putting check marks next to the thing on your to-do list uh sometimes right. like me i think go into the afterlife like that and they have to be told that's that's wonderful you've done so much donna but why don't you just sit down <laughs> what what, what's that's really interesting because I think balance is really, really important. So I find times to play. I mean, I'm an athlete. We love play. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. you know, I look at my life and make sure there's times, of course, you know, I'm working with someone right now who um, takes a lot of energy in, in uh, helping an ALS patient. Yes. But I try really hard to find balance, even within a day. So is there a day I can just walk around the block with my dog? So balance is really important to me, too. It's not like I think people have an idea when they see my resume that they, they thought I did it all in one day. Right. So no, I didn't, you know, well, and like, neither of yeah. us are in that time of life where we're getting up and reporting to work at a specific hour like we did for a lot of years, going to a job and doing what's expected and it's different when you wake up to a day that you create uh, from uh, from nothing. <laughs> How am I going to spend the day today? Exactly, and like I said, and I'm and I, I appreciate free will because of my NDE, so I don't just sit there and rotely say, "Okay, Holy Spirit, what do I do today?" As if they're giving me a checklist. It's it's a it's a partnership between. You know, how can I be of service? And then they allow me the free will to to plan my day, to create my day, to. You know, right. decide that, you know, people say, when do you rest? I said, I do. I sleep. And a friend of mine came over. Uh, a lot of people come over and visit. So I had a friend stay over and they go, you really do sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have a bed. I've, <laughs> <I see. laughs> I, I've slept at your house before. There's a bed That's, in it. There, there's a bed there. I sleep. and But to 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 really, so really what we're talking about, Father Nathan, is to be aware you know, understand your possibilities, give yourself some power and give yourself some balance and have us, you know, for our, the two of us, it's really important to have spirituality is, yeah. is a very important balance too. So I talk to people about, you know, and one of my degrees is psychology. So, you know, what's your mental, emotional, spiritual, you know, what, how's your whole self while you're here? Yeah. Look at all yeah. those dimensions. All right. Well, I think we need to have you back on this show. We're, we're near the end of it, but there's always the next thing to talk about when you're talking to Donna Rebido. So um, thanks so much. Uh, to, uh, repeat one more time the, the, uh, the, the website. Exploreconsciousness.com. That's not hard, people. Explore consciousness. It's not, it's not hard. And I made it so that it's not just, you know, challenge you a little bit. You can look up consciousness. And, and another thing Father and I love is we love word origins. So you can look that up too, yeah. consciousness. All right. Well, God bless you, dear. Thank you for God being God bless here. you. All right. Well, Thank thanks you. everybody for being along for the ride for this fun little episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. Uh, if you want to be in touch with Donna, she just tells you how to do that. If you want to be in touch with me, my website is nathan-castle.com. Uh, if you would like to be in touch, just go on there and it shows you how to do that. But for now, God bless you. I hope you have a great day. And remember, I'm praying for you and for whatever is closest to your heart. Bye now. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Joyful Friar. Please like, follow, and subscribe. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. God bless.